Hello! In today's episode we're going to continue our little series on ancient DNA and today we're going to be looking at Pictish DNA. Welcome back. So as I said we're now looking at Pictish DNA and the Picts are an amazing group of people who lived in northern and western Scotland initially but then obviously expanded their control over to other parts of modern Scotland from around about 300 AD or so right the way through till about 800-900 AD when they started to be conquered by the Scots. Now in today's episode we're going to be looking at a paper by Morez et al and their team in 2023 and this looked at Pictish DNA. Now this is a really interesting one because the paper itself causes like all DNA studies more questions than answers. To start off with they analysed two different burial grounds, Ludden Lynx in Fife and Ballantor up in Easter Ross, up in the northern part of Pictland. Now when they analysed these burial sites lots of the DNA couldn't actually be accessed because they had been corrupted or the, the, the remains had been damaged so much that the ancient DNA couldn't be extracted from the human remains. So because of that they only had eight samples as a total sample size to represent the entire Pictish population, something that we'll come back to in a little bit to discuss. So from that you've got your eight samples. Now to define these samples they've decided to use the term Pictish and the reason why is they said that the areas where these burials grounds were would be within the area of Pictish control in 700 AD at the start of the 8th century. Now this is really interesting because the genomes of the individuals whose uh, DNA has been analysed were carbon dated to the 5th to the 7th century so in fact during the actual period where they're actually alive some of the areas aren't necessarily under Pictish control. So this provides some interest for us for researchers because we're now sort of looking at it and going well was that actually under Pictish control? Was that you know British control or do we have the influence of the, um, the central and northern European migrants, the Anglo-Saxons? What's going on in and around those areas? For instance Ludden Lynx is on the frontier with Northumbrian territory and we're also British territory at the same time because we've got the famous people, the Gogodin, who are living in and around Edinburgh. So is this a British settlement and these people should better be seen as Britons or are they Picts or are they under Northumbrian control? What's going on? That's what's really interesting about this period. Is it such a melting pot? It's so uh, different, there's lots of stuff going on and you can't always just summarise things as easy cut picked Anglo-Saxon, you know, Welsh, Scot, it's a lot more complex than people like to uh, like to depict it at then. So again in this study there's a bit of a reliance on Bede and Gildas again and also Roman sources because unfortunately we don't have any sources from the Picts at this particular time and also their language is notoriously difficult to actually um, translate so we're, we're dealing with some problems here where where we would like to actually have some clear understanding you know it's it's not really there and one of the thoughts I have in my mind is like what do they actually call themselves? Pict is what the Romans called them and then Bede has actually inherited that and, and Gildas as well. One of the questions for me is actually what do they actually call themselves because the Pict is what the Romans called them and then that's been inherited by Gildas and Bede and then used within the writings. So you know is that actually what they call themselves? Do they have a different name for themselves? We just don't know because later on obviously they're taken over by the Scots and so they sort of become amalgamated and become what we today would understand as the actual Scottish today. So that's a really interesting one as well. Now with this Pictish DNA research they started off with two hypotheses. The first one was to disprove the Scythian ancestry. So one of the mythologies and you can see this within Bede's writing of the ecclesiastical histories is that the Scythians were the ancestors of the Picts and they came into uh, what is today Scotland and they settled there. That was one of the creation myths or the stories of the Picts. And the second one was for matrilineal inheritance. So they wanted to see if these people had come, you know, travelled or migrated or moved or if they hadn't done and if they could prove any matrilineal inheritance through that research as well. 
There is a little bit of an issue for this as well because um, we see the matrilineal inheritance in the Pictish king lists, but again, it's amongst the kings. So if it's amongst the kings, does that mean the normal Picts are practicing that? That's a question as well. Is it a full cultural thing or is it just a royal thing to separate the royals from the normal people? They weren't able to prove matrilineal inheritance through the research, and so that was one thing there. And they were able to disprove the Scythian DNA, um, and the Scythians were people who lived on the steppe, so parts of Ukraine, Russia, uh, Belarus, that sort of area, uh, during the Roman period and before. So they were able to disprove that as an ancestry for the Picts. Now, what they did find was that the Pictish um, population that they had were related to the modern-day Irish, Scots, Welsh, Northumbrian, and also to the Iron Age Britons from other samples that they had throughout the British Isles. Which, again, shouldn't be too much of a surprise because we can presume that these populations came over during the Bronze Age as a part of the Bronze Age migration into the British Isles and then continued throughout the Roman period into the early medieval period. So, again, disproving the Scythians but proving that these people were a part of that Bronze Age migration earlier on. Following on from that, they actually found that of their samples, two of their samples had relations to populations of the south and the east of the British Isles. Now what I really find quite funny about this is that in the paper they do everything possible to not use the word Germanic or Anglo-Saxon, but with these two different burial grounds, the, the um, Ludden Lynx produced seven human remains and the Ballantor up in Easter Ross produced one. The individual up in Ballantor, right up in the north of what is now today modern Scotland, actually in their recent ancestry had Anglo-Saxon or you know, Central and Northern European DNA. So they were their ancestors, you know, either father, grandfather, or someone within, or um, you know, grandmother or um, mother or someone in their ancestry had actually had this Central and Northern European DNA, which again comes back to their conclusion, which was that the, the Pictish population was not homogenous, but was actually a very mixed population as well, just like the rest of the early medieval populations. I mean, if you watch the Anglo-Saxon DNA video that I've done as well, they see that the, the, the Anglo-Saxons were mixing with the native uh, Romano-British or British populations. So it wasn't a case that these population groups were very, you know, separated or anything like that. And you, when you look at the history of the early kings of Northumbria, you know, you have this warlord called Ailthrith, and his first son, Enfrith, as she goes and lives amongst the Picts, marries a Pictish princess, and then one of his descendants actually ends up fighting against one of Ailthrith's other descendants, um, Enfrith. So these two um, warrior kings are actually great cousins through the same ancestry back to Ailthrith. So you've got this a really interesting thing where just because he's Northumbrian or Anglo-Saxon doesn't mean he can't go amongst the Picts. He's just as welcome in, Picts, in the Pictish territory as he is, well, he's less welcome in the Northumbrian territory because he's not a part of the, the royal dynasty. He has to go away, which is what a lot of these young princes did. So you have to understand that maybe second or third sons of the Northumbrians may would have ended up in Ireland, in Wales, in Pictland, or other places like that, or in the other Northumbrian kingdoms, just as much as they would have ended up in Anglo-Saxon kingdoms, and they could have made lives for themselves. So it's a big question of how much do these kingdoms were, you know, solid lines on a, on a, um, on a page, like we see them today, and how much of these genetic groupings were actually seen as like solid, um, sol solid cultural groups, that you know you can't marry into them because they are such and such or you can't be associated with them because they're such and such or was it a lot more about who was your king who is your tribal leader that was more important and your genetics didn't matter as much as you sort of like culturally converted or became a part of that group these are the questions that we're dealing with in this amazing period of the early medieval uh, period but one thing that is very clear from this early pictish study is that eight human remains are not enough we need a lot more to understand the Picts and to see how, you know, if there was any variation between that Iron Age British uh, genetics or if there were cultural differentiations or if there was a Central and Northern European or like what we call Anglo-Saxon settlement in certain parts of what is today Scotland that was previously not been seen. What's going on during this period? Some of that can be seen 
through the migration in genetics and some of it has to be done through archaeology to see you know the items the cultural artifacts that pick up and as some of it has to be done through historical sources but altogether we're constantly learning constantly developing and learning amazing things but uh, it definitely tickled me that uh, one of the individuals who was in this Pictish DNA study was at least in part inverted commas Anglo-Saxon or Central and Northern uh, European ancestry though to say how they identified personally would be another totally different thing they could have seen themselves as Pictish as anything or they might have seen themselves as another identity we don't know about because it's been lost to time but ultimately I really hope you've enjoyed today's episode it's going for new food for thought and you'll go away and you'll actually read the paper yourself I'll put a link down in the description but in the meantime stay safe and well I hope you'll subscribe and like the video if you haven't already done so and if you'd like to support me further I do have links to my Patreon and my coffee account down below which helps me dedicate time to creating these videos for you other than that I hope you'll join me for another video in the near future but in the meantime stay safe and well and thank you very much